There's that, that, that. All right. All right. Standing here before you. All right. Well. Okay, great. Hello, world. This is my, as we will hear from her, as we will hear from her herself, this is, this is her letter to the world. And as such, it is a letter within a letter, in every sense of the word, so to speak, then, a convocation of voices, a convocation of voices, each voice, the vehicle of successions of thought, suggestions of thought and suggestions of ideas. And they are formed into subjects of conversation. They are formulated into subjects of conversation among those beings who are interested in working together to formulate for the benefit of the planet via the species, via the sense of taste, via the faculty of reasoning, via the gift of fluency in reasoning to create works to convey the thoughts that will be of benefit to further the understanding of the subject, which is the subject of the conversation, which is the subject of the democratic conversation. So, on a quiet street where old ghosts meet, I see her walking now away from me so hurriedly that my reason must allow that I have wooed not as I should a creature made of clay. Ah, when the angel moves her wings, she blooms at the dawning of the day. So, we're speaking then of a literary presence evoked um, from within the letter conveyed by the voice. Uh, it is taking place along the lineaments of a great and flowing and beginningless and endless conversation of ideas which have inspired, in a religious sense, that of democracy, which can be spoken of in religious terms, um, that in art, which can be spoken of in artistic terms, which are religious terms, in the way that I'm using that term religious, meaning to join together, to join together for the purposes of uh, a formal expression of what is both within and without the human sphere of reasoning. The works of art, then, uh, especially those works of art, the literary works of art, carried by the voice into the stream, into the convocation of the, the democratic conversation. So, so much confusion of terms, and it is not the purpose of the expression that I'm doing now to clarify these terms in any sense other than what they might mean to me or to you as individuals. But it grew out of a religious sense. Why were they at the foundation, at the base of the hill we climb, the, in the windswept northeast, the forefathers who first realized revolution. Why? The poet was speaking of New Englanders. And the New Englanders were those who, in the intermediary days, both 
before, within, and after the establishment of the, um, you know, revolutionary democratic concept of the United States of America, um, it were, it were, they were the ones who were formulating this notion that had been brought to them into this wilderness, into this landscape both within and without, a garden at times and a wilderness surrounding it, which somehow had something to do with the inwardness of the life of each, the life of those in the garden and the life of those in the wilderness. Um, they had this formulation then, religiously based, of um, the individual's sense of moral agency, of f consciousness exercised in the intrinsic act of choosing, evaluating, observing, perceiving, interpreting, coming to know, and this being the foundation of what makes the human being intrinsically the human being. The foundation of what they later spoke of as inalienable rights. And included within the rights was also the responsibility. And then you can speak of it in terms of notions of virtue and of faith. But maybe just to crystallize it if such a diamond can be crystallized, this notion of perfection, this notion of divine perfection, and this notion that this divine perception of this divine perfection was embodied in the individual form of an individual human being. An awareness of the value of individuality rather than individualism. I'm talking about the ones in the American ideational slipstream who first called themselves liberals. They were the inheritors of the Puritan tradition. They inherited the Puritan tradition of introspective rigor. They inherited the Puritan tradition of this notion, this ideal of the freedom of individual consciousness. And they held in common the notion of the, this quality called the free will. The free will and what that meant. So entrancing was this notion of the free will that they built entire worlds of thought around it sometimes to hedge it in, sometimes to allow it to jump the fence, sometimes gates for it to open and to close. But always, it was a form in transit, so to speak, to contain this human will. But then there was this other quality also, though. You know, some of them, they read, they brought books with them. They were devoted, devoted to reading. Reading for them was a form of thought so that as they studied, they read, and as they worked, they wrote. And their conversation became so pervasive among those who were thinking about such things that there came this common platform of ideas that they shared. They were liberals. This is how they worked. They had the notion of the perfection of understanding belonging only to God. This was its uh, foundational formulation as a religious tenet, you could say, but it, it's taken always further than that into the inner being of the individual where religion receives its original value, where religious values go to molt to metamorphosize, to be enhanced or be diminished, to find polarities, to be born anew, so to speak. All these things happen within the human soul. In this way, the human soul, the individual human soul is the image of God. 
and it is given free will. What is the exercise of free will as it means to consciousness? To consciousness, the exercise of free will is judgment. The judgment of the true value of something which is not really a thing, which you cannot see with your eyes. This was the way they expressed their understanding of the divine. This was the way they expressed their understanding of society. I with my voice and my thoughts. You with you vo your voice and your thoughts. And you with your voice and your thoughts. And you with your voice and your thoughts. And you and you and you and you and all. And me and I and I and thou. This convocation became the accumulation, the accumulation of the upsurge poetically of what constitutes a conception of the emotional structure of the nature of democratic thought as a convocation of voices platformed off of, so to speak, certain shared values, certain shared values of the human being as being an example in the image of divine consciousness, whatever way you conceive of it, and you do not have to conceive of it because it is and it isn't and it is and it isn't and it isn't and it, and it is. This is the nature of language. See it, you know, in that way. And you are free of any conception that would hold you back from understanding the essence of what that really means. And there you have freedom. Freedom. Freedom of religion. What did that mean? What does it mean really? It means freedom to create poetically on your own terms out of the uh, impetus of your own original inner nature and to offer it to the community to consider and to contemplate. And for this, we have many fine perceptors, seers. I see her walking now, coming out of a locket, away from me so hurriedly that my reason must allow that she is reserved. And she is reserved. This is her nature. Think of it. A hermit in a wilderness of a landscape common to us all and yet offered freely the fruits of her garden, her poetic virtue, and her style. The style. The style. Ah, the style which stops and starts at first it seems. When she wrote to Thomas Wentworth Higginson, one of the first of the abolitionists, himself a supporter of John Brown, with all the troubling implications of that, and yet one committed to an ideal of equality far ahead, far ahead of his times. These were her correspondents. These were New England Whigs, her father, Emily's, for that's who I'm talking about. Her father was a congressman for a while. And yes, they were descendants of the Puritans living there in Amherst. Emily took to schooling. <laughs> and you know, this is a side note, the transcendentalists, uh, the ones who paid a lot of attention to the uh, currents at the time of um, childhood education, the forerunners of Maria Montessori and, and uh, other thinkers, had their beginnings in New England also, among liberals, among liberals who by then read not only their own sacred scripture, but read the scriptures of other religions and noticed the commonality and noticed the equality, knowing already, having been attuned to it by their God, how to attend to the notions of quality in individuals and equality between individuals and amongst individuals, and a social structure to reflect that could be born in oh so many ways. Among them, these notions of um, progressive education in um, childhood. And so 
Emily learned of taxonomy, botany. Of course, she learned to pay attention closely to the things that she read. At the same time, she, l- she saw the flight of the butterfly. She saw the, the flower sprouting and going through its metamorphoses and its entangled germinations and the way it brings the birds of the air and the bees buzzing to feast upon the bounty that nature offers. All these things poured through the portals of her senses. But there was more than that. Well, more of what made her uniquely herself. And that is this style. Let's not forget. That's what we're talking about. This, well, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, whom I mentioned, was uh, the recipient of an important letter from Emily Dickinson. The letter was written to him in response to an editorial he wrote in the Atlantic Monthly, I think it was. Magazines back then had such names as they have now. And for this, we can be thankful (laughs) in a certain sense. But he had written a call on the young writers to not silence their voices, attending to the notions uttered by the sage upon the hillside who said, let not your light be, let not your lamp be held under a bushel basket. A city on a hill must shine for the world, you know. Something about him was hearkening to that. And how did that inspired idea from back then produce its fruit in that moment of that time? Thomas Wentworth Higginson received a letter in the mail. He opened it up. It was from Emily Dickinson asking him, basically, if her verse breathed, if her verse breathed. Well, he was an inspired reader himself, and he read it, and we could say that he somehow knew that this was a a notion of inspiration expressed upon the paper that was so different from what he was used to seeing that it was beyond his capacity to evaluate in any way other than the humble way. For that also is a liberal way, the humble way of knowing that each of us, although an image of God, is only a partial image of God. And as we come to know and understand one another, we also realize that they too are partial images of God. So we are all fallible. So we have to look with hum- humility upon those unique expressions. And Thomas Wentworth Higginson probably thought to himself, well, I called for it, and now here it is. Does it breathe, she asks. Right away, he's taken with her way of expressing herself. She writes to him in this letter. She says, In appearance, I am like the wren, My hair is dark brown, like the chestnut burr. She writes, my eyes are like the sherry left in the glass, left in the empty glass after the visitor drinks and departs. She said that paraphrased slightly. But he realized, oh, this is a hermit who uses the theatrical mode of expressing herself. I bet he heard of it in certain places. I bet he was connected to that particular archetype of a playful yet solemn persona, because that is is Emily Dickinson, among many other things. That's the captivation. That's That's where the hook took, so to speak. But it wasn't something that she did in a calculated sense. No, she was expressing this out of the inwardness of her nature. And of this, she was assured. This is her gift also. Her assuredness, her assuredness of her value and of her expressive and spiritual gift uh, took form in her in the most natural way that in such a natural way that we can come to know it for ourselves in our own way. 
if we pay attention to her work uh, the way democratic citizens should, which is to attend to it in whatever humble way one knows. So, uh, that being said, um, she knows that um, at the same time, you know, this self, this great self, stand in the presence of the great self of history, the classic archetypal Grecian bust of Emily Dickinson in the Pantheon. What is it? It is exaggeration, of course, but it is also what stoops to conquer, and what stoops to conquer is when we see her along the quiet street. Okay? So it grows from this form we house. So as she puts it here, the body grows without the more convenient way that if the spirit like to hide, its temple stands all way, ajar, secure, inviting. It never did betray the soul that asked its shelter in solemn honesty. So what you have given as a gift to human consciousness for us to attend to now is a most skillful question put to her own inner soul and a most assured answer coming back to her and to us that the soul is welcome in the body. Something in us needs to know this. Emily Dickinson provides it to the individual soul. It is welcome in the body in which it is housed because that is what the body is made for. Now, parenthetically, William Blake, on the other side of that big ocean to the east, his way of expressing his own liberal vision was through more melodramatic, harsh, and gnarly, and gothic, and dramatically, harshly mythical terms, perhaps partially because of the landscape from which he came. Not that Emily Dickinson's landscape was less harsh. She was aware of every aspect of it, from the corners of her room, to the barnyard, to the wilderness, to the commerce among people. She knew all sides of human nature there. But William Blake expressed it in like more, you could say, pictorial terms. There's something about uh, Emily Dickinson's style that is urbane in the way that it would be in the democratic tradition, especially the liberal democratic New England tradition in between the Puritans and the transcendentalists and having universal geniuses a part of each of its manifestations who partake of one another and germinate each other like seeds across these oh-so-often artificial divisions, these thresholds between literary terms for schools, such as transcendentalism, literary terms for religions, such as Puritanism or Calvinism. But that being said, um, the polarity, we did mention that word, metamorphosize, in the process of which one comes perhaps along the way to find the relationship of one to one's other in polarity, harmonious, balanced, uh, reciprocal um, mutuality, these kind of forces, these kinds of energies. The arts of diplomacy, these things develop stylistically in the city-states, from the time of the city-states in, in Italy. Beginning, you know, we th speak of Machiavelli in a certain kind of adjective for a certain kind of, you know, coldness or cunning or opportunism, and I'm sure that there is that, but that we also could speak of Machiavelli like we could speak of Clausewitz, someone, both of whom, from later times, of course, you know, Clausewitz is much later than 
than uh, Machiavelli, but in a way, they are humanists. They are looking, or one of their questions is, I mean, Machiavelli, certainly he wants to establish his goal, and that takes precedence over all other values. So in that way, Machiavelli is Machiavellian. But in another, another sense, Machiavelli is aware of a dimension of value outside of the local religions or factions that the negotiator might be engaged with, some other value other than the group identification. And this is like the rational side of what the American liberals knew in a religious way, because there was that appeal to rational self-interest based on a kind of valuing that had its primary expression as the, you know, uh, rational calculus, the thought or mind of the, the trader, the mercantilist, the calculator, and also the governor, the administrative body, these cold ratios. Yes, a colder ratio would be uh, in play for many of the balances of power. And the warmer ratios would be perhaps the tribal identifications or the family identifications or the um, kinship group gatherings. These kind of things were also the glue of society. And, you know, it's the visionary gift of some of those diplomats as cunning as they were, some of those courtiers. You know, they gave their persona to many a villain in many a play, as you might well imagine. And yet at the same time, out of uh, that uh, origin point, there came the whole diplomatic tradition and the concepts of statescraft, which include decorum between states, which include notions of mutual respect, which include the understanding that each presence at the table has their own understanding of the most basic terms. And sometimes common ground is a mystery. How could it be found? And yet it must be sought for civic discourse. Civil discourse demands it. And that is a necessity of the civilized arts as they conceived of it. Mm. And yet, in the soul, we know from the start that the world that we come from is the world until the curtain falls. And then there is that which we must understand as experience, which is hot and cold and good and bad and whole and broken and full and empty and constantly changing. And yet, that too is the world that's the world we come to know, to understand. And yet there's that original kind of purity. And it still is, uh, there's something still that is there that reminds us of the original feeling of the mind and its own identity. And it is that, that Emily Dickinson's style is kind of the graph of, or the script of, including its stops and starts as a motion through time. So you read it, and as you become attuned to that voice, you experience time in a different way to yourself, like a different passage almost. And it seems like that in turn becomes a source of energy for that which in the verse that does breathe. For yes, the verse does breathe. I don't know if Thomas Wentworth Higginson said that in so many words. He, uh, he attended to what she said. He did not really give advice except to, to not publish until a longer work came to be or something like that, something to kind of just step back from and still attend to. It was a humble thing for him to do, and in that way he inspired her as she inspired him. Actually, sometimes I feel like 
uh, it is through his impression that um, she is seen the way she is seen. Not that he made a work of art to concretize that or express that, except to refer to it, you know, in a conversation, in the form of a conversation. It is almost like the literary presence has come to us via these inner conversations that seem to go on and on, whether they are heard or not, or whether they become quote unquote public knowledge or not. It's the public and the private kind of thing. And that's also an important, the pilgrims used that term private judgment. They, I believe private consciousness, private uh, judgment, private uh, freedom, one's own. It comes from the Reformation, the whole Protestant Reformation, of which the Puritans were a unique um, em- exemplar of. And um, then these notions became developed. Oh, but this is important to say. These notions became discussed among professed among professed believers. And yet the terms, the criteria, were very, very simple. It was two things, really. The notion of God's perfection and human free will in relation to that. After that, all other subjects were on the table. You see? It was only later on that there came to be a notion of like orthodoxy or like orthodox Christianity, uh, like orthodox Christianity taking the form of belief, orthodox belief, belief in what? Belief in supernatural, belief in supernatural drama of a blameless soul who died for the sins of all. It was this along with the Calvinist notion of the eternally damned and the elect and the uh, inevitability of that, which, you know, gives it that harsh kind of on point kind of thing. But that was only one interpretation of what it meant to be a Christian. For some reason, in the way the story is so often told in popular terms, it seems to be, you know, almost like the go-to expression or the go-to way of understanding but when you draw back the veil after all isn't that something that is to be done when you're talking about revelation you draw back the veil and you see oh american religious tradition its history is far more complex than a dominant particular ideology expressed in a dominant and particular way and among the ones who formulated the ideas of free will and equality, it was that way because their piety was expressed in their open-ended approach to the problems that arose mutually in the community. At the same time, they did have confidence in their own judgment. And yet, at the same time, they had a commitment to understanding that in light of the judgment of another, their own might be revealed to them as missing somewhere because all have sinned. You see, that awareness was part of their religion. And then, of course, came from England because they were in dialogue with English writers, of course. But then because of the Romantic movement started happening early on, soon... It became available more commonly to the transcendentalists, but they were around earlier. Copies of the Bhagavad Gita and the Upanishads and Buddhist texts and Persian texts and poets such as Hafez. So these things were also around too, speaking of the same things that their own religion spoke of. But their own religion had taught them that the proper exercise of their moral judgment out of their own free will based on the image of himself that their creator had made them of, that they could attend to the truth in these other religions as well without doing harm to their own. That being said, they disagreed about a lot of other things. 
and sometimes as the Tower of Babel naturally falls. They used terms of one disagreement in terms of another disagreement, and they failed to understand the demarcation between the public and the private, for example, or the old sin of self-justification began to arise, so it's not like there weren't those kind of problems. Of course there were. Anyway, so... Emily saw beyond all this. But she did not put in, in terms of anything other than what came from her own voice and her own experience. The style is not suggested in any grandeur of historical backdrop. The writing is not meant to amass power, prestige, or respect of one kind or another, because such things would be foreign to her inspiration, which, as I said, is essentially that of a hermit, and yet a hermit with a deep gift of pantomime. A hermit whose meditation is so precise in its pinpoint, in its focus, so sustained and so concentrated that the abstract ceases to be abstract and yet is abstract all the more for that, presented in an asymmetrical way. Asymmetrical. Now, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, Thomas Wentworth Higginson might have referred to her grammar as fractured, but that's not really the word it's asymmetrical. She's a cubist. It's calligraphy, but this also it is origami. It's origami folded in asymmetries. And when the sharpness appears, it's not quite where you think it would be. Nothing is where you quite think it would be. As she jumps back and forth, will-o'-the-wisp-like in that way, pantomime-like, and yet reserved. She uh, tells us this, says this. It's a true observation. I totally agree. After reading it, I'm sure you will too. Funny to be a century and see the people going by. I should die of the oddity, but then I'm not so staid as he is. He keeps his secrets safely, very. Were he to tell, extremely sorry this bashful globe of ours would be so dainty of publicity. See? She's not like that. Uh-uh. She's telling us. Funny. It's funny to be a century. And you can laugh if you want to. Funny to be a century. Well, you know, what mask is that? What mask is that that you wear to be a century? It's not a mask. It's seen through a mask, see the people going by. For her, it's too weird. I should die of the oddity, but I'm not so staid as he. In other words, she knows it's a different kind of decorum to be an abstract quality like time or like measurement. Maybe it's more like that, measurement of time as a century. No, she's not going to be like that. He's the one who keeps his secrets She's not going to keep her secrets. At least, she's not going to keep her secrets in that moment, in that poem, in that way. And yet, she's reserved. Um, we learned the whole of love. This is what she writes. We learned the whole of love. The alphabet, the words. A chapter. Then the mighty book. Then... Revelation closed. But in each other's eyes an ignorance beheld, diviner than the childhood's, and each to each a child, attempted to expound what neither understood. Alas, that wisdom is so large and truth so manifold. So, it's like, yes, the revelation, 
then the closure of the revelation, and then the traces that we see, the signs that we see. And they're not all the joyful mysteries. There is the perplexities, the ignorances, those kind of things. So, um, <laughs> you know, as I might have mentioned, the growth of Romanticism. She, let's talk about her reading list for a moment. Now, it's not a list. She studied the plants. She knew the classification systems. She had an extensive garden in the backyard. She had a fondness for exotic sensing, sense, sensory flowers, flowers of scent, so that, as she put it, sometimes her kitchen smelt like the Spice Islands. She created another kind of book, an herborium of some 460 pressed plants, herbs, classified according to the systems, the Latin systems of Linnaeus. Other texts then abounded so she could read in many other ways than, than the ways that are given by the poem. And yet her sense of understanding how the news of the world gets put down is reflected in the unique kind of topography of the spirit in the letters and the words of her poems. So she read in Ruskin, she read the Brownings, she read uh, Keats, uh, she read Revelations. She was familiar with the whole of the Bible, of course, and it charged her thoughts. Her reading was elemental in that her understanding, the understanding of her imagination was conceptual. What could that mean <laughs> in a world of computer images, in the world of the flat screen, in the world of the domineering pontalism of the, of the digital visual image and the ways it changes and the ways it brings thoughts to mind, which are basically memories of the images that it has seen before in that same medium? What does it mean to know and see conceptually? We all know it. It is our God-given right. It is our God-given responsibility to develop it. And for this, the poets do their thing. And for this, the listeners to poets do their thing also. And in this, the ideas are revivified and freshened. As the Confucian text by Lang Zi, some sage who writes the inscription that Ezra Pound quoted upon the uh, wash tub of the emperor, make it new, as Ezra Pound put it, as Zhang Zi says in a rendering that I'm paying attention to recently, says something like, renewal, it teaches something like, renewal is of the day, therefore practice renewal each day. Renewal is of the day, therefore practice renewal each day. Or as William Blake said, uh, Prayer is the study of art. Praise is the practice of art. So the practice of her art takes place in invisible places. And yet what she describes is real. See it conceptually when she says, Growth of man, like growth of nature, gravitates within Atmosphere and sun endorse it, but it stir alone. Each its difficult ideal must achieve. Itself through the solitary prowess of a silent life. Effort is the sole condition, patience of itself. Patience of opposing forces and intact belief. Looking on is the department of the audience, but transaction is assisted by no countenance. Transaction is assisted by no countenance. It's the original face. It's the face of the deep. It's the germination of the soul, of the seed, 
of the soul as seed, which has fallen into the darkness of the temporal world of solid form and now germinates in the dark because of this blind urge, this blind urge to be. Um. <laughs> so, this was a poet. This was a poet. It is that distills amazing sense from ordinary meanings and attar so immense from the familiar species that perished by the door, we wonder it was not ourselves arrested it before. Of pictures, the discloser, the poet it is he, entitles us by contrast to ceaseless poverty. Of portions so unconscious, the robbing could not harm himself to him a fortune exterior to time. And yet, she says, I have no life but this to lead it here, nor any death but lest dispelled from there. No tie to earth's to come, nor action new, except through this extent, the realm of you. A total commitment then to dissolve the form created. And what makes the form therefore so compelling for that reason? There's something very samurai-like about Emily Dickinson and her sense of form. I mean, it's one step to see the crease, the fold, the indentation, the suggestions that the punctuation makes. The suggestions that the punctuation makes appeal directly to that part of the soul which enters into its lair in the pronunciation of those words. It is a formal move that baffles my sense, unless I choose to let it speak to me, almost to fall under its spell. After all, it's the gift of the mind, given and received and the breathing of the verse. This is the nature of the breathing of the verse. The verse, the verse breathes, of course. Um, so, so, to own the art within the soul, to own the art within the soul, this is where Emily Dickinson um, is, you know, providing, you know, uh, Perhaps um, it's not the right word to call it uh, a model. No, I believe it would be, once more, an image. It's an image made of real intuitive strokes on an otherwise empty canvas. Very, very Japanese. Very, very wabi-sabi. Very, very consisting of the delicate relentlessness of a sense of discrimination that could be exercised to the utmost, even described as ruthless. There is this, really, in the poems of Emily Dickinson, and this is one of the things that give her her charm. Of course, she describes herself as Wren-like. And have you seen Wrens? You wouldn't want to get pecked by that beak if you were a bug. And it could be worth it to be a bug, to be so close to a minute vision of one of God's creatures, but I wouldn't do it because it would be dangerous. Nevertheless, you see the intelligence of the wren when the wren pecks and picks and pecks and picks and finds just the right size of straw, the right size bit of straw to build her nest, and then darts off your window pane. So when she describes herself as the wren, you will know a creature of discrimination and, if necessary, of fierceness. She describes the husk of the chestnut burr. Well, we can only imagine the strength of the branches of the tree and the many birds that it shelters, that are sheltered there. It is like the body to the soul, the place where the soul finds providence and nurturing and uh, sustenance of all kinds. And then what was the other thing she said? Like the sherry left in the glass, 
by the departed guest. Oh, wow. You know, if she'd never written anything more than that, it would be like this library, this would be filled with commentaries <laughs> on that because it is that of the senses which is most uh, touched by the most least. Ah, yes, this is what I'm saying. Maybe I'm getting too hyperbolic, which is my nature. Here's the polarity, the hyperbolist. I'm playing that role at the moment. But then the minimalist, the creative minimalist, the reserved one, the hermit that is Emily Dickinson, the creative minimalist where the games take place in an atmosphere of silence, but the atmosphere of silence is never where you think that you come to uh, expect it. Um, so longing is like the seed that wrestles in the ground, believing if it intercede, it shall at length be found. The arrow, no, the arrow, no, the hour, the hour and the climb, each circumstance unknown, what constancy must be achieved before it see the sun. She meant these things to be unfolded and read. Evidently, uh, intricate books were made. Um, that kind of scholarship is known. I'm not one who knows the details of it, but I believe that knowing the nature of the butterfly and the bird, there is some understanding of the way the page is to be unfolded and turned that would probably be part of the experience of reading the poem, reading it in the way that, uh, the creative way, the inspired way that she did it. Um, almost like reading it this way too, only it is the forms that exist in the realm of you. <laughs> Thought is energy. Poems are transition points of that energy. Uh, the poet can help that charge to jump the gap at certain transition points because the poet desires contact with it. So, some would say, oh, that's the model of the ego self emerging from oblivion. And of course, it could be spoken of this way, but it could also be seen as a human enactment of all it can know of a divine idea which it has heard somewhere but doesn't remember where. It was conceived somewhere, but by hands other than the one who is trying to conceive it at that moment. It has been understood in other places, but never in the terms that demand that it be understood in, in the one's mind who is grappling with it at that very moment. Almost like a seed in the darkness of the ground struggling to germinate and become its next form in the succession of natural things, to be in the image of the way that God made it, knowing that that image itself takes place in change and mutability. Therefore, the intelligence that tracks it must create forms hitherto unseen in order to meet the demands of its inner call to create. And so, uh, Emily Dickinson's words are fully, fully in this realm of value. So, to own the art within the soul, because that's what we're talking about, she writes, to own the art within the soul, the soul to entertain with silence as a company and festival maintain is an unfurnished circumstance. Possession is to one as an estate perpetual or a reduceless mine. And here it's like 
that moment when you fall off the edge of it is when you realize, oh, she's utilizing part of her asymmetrical vocabulary here. She has rhymes, but she uses the rhymes in all kinds of ways that mm, were not necessarily conventionally received at the time. Her, some 10 of her poems were published in her time, um, but in a most unsatisfactory way, at least it seems that way to me, they were somewhat bowdlerized, not like that there was risque content, but they were altered to fit conventional tastes. And so like the weird rhymes could not be understood, nor the compressed kind of asymmetrical twist that is part of the poem was not perceived at all. And something else was just plastered onto it, pasted onto it. And um, so there was something about her that knew that the trajectory of her work would be in, in really in the ways that we're dealing with it here and now as part of a convocation of voices going down through time um, because that was the context with which, out of which she wrote. It was her correspondence. It was her um, conversation and work among her neighbors and her friends. Um, it was her study of the things that she did, like the gardening and and the um, botany and the flower classifications and the deep reading and the inspired meditations. And as time went on, of course, though, there came to be that in her persona, which is probably, there's probably, that's probably such an archetype that in the history of small towns everywhere, there are those people who were reserved and they become a part of the inner life of the citizens who grew up, grew up in these places. It is a timeless, a timeless thing. I've seen them myself. Actually, in my own neighborhood as a child. She came out of the woods. She was in this nightdress. She was aged. Her legs were scratched like she'd been in the brambles. She came up to me and said, have you seen my chickens? And I said, I didn't know there were chickens here. She said, yeah, my chickens got loose. I've been looking for them down in the woods. Have you seen my chickens? And I said, oh, there's chickens. That was the harsh screech I've been hearing in the morning. That must be her rooster. And so later on, I had these conversations with her. I would tell her news of the horned toads that I had seen and chased barefoot on the hot city streets. And she would tell me, oh, if you ever find a horned toad and it's dead, bring it to me and I'll bring it back to life. Well, that made me think, and then I would tell her about tarantulas. Tarantulas were fascinating, the ways that they moved and their creepiness, and yet their grace, their strange, slow grace, and their almost benevolence, and their ugliness, fascinating. And she said, oh, once there was a tarantula that was caught in a bank vault down in Weatherford. <laughs> yep. The tarantula crawled into the bank vault. They closed the door of the bank vault and locked it and kept it there for 100 years. And 100 years later, they opened up the bank vault door and the tarantula is still alive. She said that. And in me, the child, here's the thing. Uh, sometimes I could like, you know, sort of like get off on the fact that I knew that she wasn't telling the truth. I knew that that was impossible. But then on another level, I didn't need to accept that, pro or con, to know what she was talking about. And she was talking to me in an age-old language, really, and trusting that I would understand it and that it would come to fruition now, as I tell you. So it is along those kind of lines in democracy that the spiritual poetics kind of like rises and falls and sometimes it becomes the um, ground under which through which from which is born a fructification and a gestation and a germination and a renaissance whatever you want to call it but that is not um, that is not the point fame of myself to justify she says note she is a hermit Note what she has done. She is both known and unknown. She is both of renown and yet I see her through the portal of her locket 
And I know I can come no closer than that. And yet I know also that a presence is established through this, more intimate than the personality, which seems to be transient, and yet it is the medium from which grows that true self, which is essentialized in the poem. Fame of myself to justify, all other plaudit be, superfluous and incense beyond necessity. Fame of myself to lack, although my name be else supreme, this were an honor honorless, a futile diadem. Is she saying that she is her own, own audience? No. She is speaking in a sense of this very thing, democratic self-possession. Self-possession expressed so uniquely in the poetic form that it becomes a classic for this reason. But this democratic self-possession, which attends just as wholly, as effectively, as devotedly to its inner understanding of its own experience and its feeling and its memory of experience and its judgment and the factors within its judgment that it tries to be mindful of all at once in the gifted, you know, vision, um, whatever that was. Um, it's like this. It rises to a crescendo and then it steps back in a certain sense, almost like it disappears. The drop, she writes. This is an old trope from mystical uh, writings. The world over, the drop and the ocean. You know, the individual in its utter form and the vastness which it also is. And so her take on it is the drop that wrestles in the sea. No, we've already mentioned a seed falling in the darkness of the ground and struggling to become a living form. Now this is the drop that wrestles in the sea. The drop that wrestles in the sea forgets her own locality as I toward thee. She knows herself, an incense small, yet small she sighs. If all is all, how larger be? The ocean smiles at her conceit. But she, forgetting Amphitrite, pleads, me? Amphitrite was the consort of Poseidon, the god of the sea. And she in this universal fullness of life, questions herself as to who she is and answers out of that, out of that. So let me see um, the time here. And then perhaps I will tell you more. She, um, oh, okay. So, like about 10-ish mm, more minutes or something? Okay. Thank you so far for your heroic listening. And that being said, this world, this world of meaning, this world of possible uh, uh, launching pads or openings of understanding or interest, let's see what Emily Dickinson says for the next thought arising from that. She writes, This world is not conclusion. A species stands beyond. Invisible is music, but positive is sound. It beckons and it baffles. Philosophy don't know, and through a riddle at the last, sagacity, sagacity must go. To guess it puzzles scholars. To gain it, men have borne contempt of generations and crucifixion shown. Faith slips and laughs and rallies, blushes if any see, plucks at a twig of evidence 
and asks a vain the way. Much gesture from the pulpit, strong hallelujahs roll. Narcotics cannot still the tooth that nibbles at the soul. That about says it all, huh? The world is not conclusion. They knew the Puritans, the liberals, the thinkers, the poets, those in whom was germinating a vision of human society that would come to contain the seeds of its own self-overcoming again and again. Out of one voice, many. Out of many voices, one. A breathing back and forth in that sense. Of the people and by the people and for the people. And yet, in whom is all of that contained? In you and in me as individuals. And this is the nature of an individual to be composed in this way and to communicate in this way. And even then, there are surprising truths, surprising in their familiarity and in their obviousness and in the ways we always knew them. For example, she writes, or someone writes, or maybe no one writes, it is written, I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us? Don't tell. They'd advertise, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog, to tell one's name. The live long June to an admiring bog. <laughs> Again, I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Then there's a pair of us? Don't tell. They'd advertise, you know. How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog, to tell one's name the live long June to an admiring bog. She writes, and this is important too. In this convocation, in this river, it flows. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise. As lightning to the children, eased with explanation kind. The truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. Let the truth be part of a succession. Hold it lightly and feel the connection as it slips through your hands. Gather it at certain points when necessary to contain it long enough that it be held in the utterance of living speech. And there's an art to that. She offers the fruits of her practice to us to attend to. But at the same time, understand it as something that changes form and yet carries on within itself according to its own inner dynamic, according to its own inner logic. So just a couple more things. That one part where she writes from a couple of poems back, Faith slips and laughs and rallies and blushes if any sees. Plucks at a twig of evidence and asks a vein the way. She means a weather vane. And a weather vane is in the image of a crow. And it was only this poem, that line, that image became the explanation for an understanding of something that I saw on a hillside one dusk. A stiff wind was blowing from the west. There was a large uh, cypress, 
a Pacific coast cypress, craggy and large, fronded and beautiful and jagged, overlooking the entire hillside, must have been there for a long old time, and there was a cluster of crows around it, seven or eight. And what the crows were doing? The crows were surfing. The crows were having fun. They were surfing on the currents of the wind. They would sweep under it with swoops, ride to the crest of where an upper part of the wind was, where they could kind of perch themselves a moment, wings outspread, and then they would drift back rapidly as if sent that way by a surf of wind. And there was more to it than that, though. There was a prop that they were using. There was. They were making use of the environment to make it for f more fun for themselves especially one of the crows. I could tell it was only one of the crows that was doing this. It was continuing to do this. And what it was doing was it would be allow itself to drift back on the wind. And then when it went by a certain twig sticking out of the upper heights of the cypress tree, the crow grasped onto it with its beak and held on to it for like a trembling moment, though pushed by the wind. And so that when it let go, it went out even faster from acceleration gained by that moment of being still, grasping on to the twig, even as the energy of the wind was blowing it, you see. And what was more amazing than all of that was the crow seemed to know of the nonchalance of its actions. It seemed like when it flapped toward it for the second or third time, there was a certain toss of its shoulder, and the way it held its head as it grasped onto the branch and let go, and then went back. There was that, and then there was this horizontal barrel roll they did that seemed so glider-like. And So, what that was then, when Emily Dickinson writes about the soul and all that, all that it undertakes in itself, the faculties that propel the gracefulness of its motion in regard to these unfurnished circumstances, as she puts them. The unfurnished circumstances, these are the places that become the subject of her reflections. And then when we attend to them, we come to see them as occasions, as signs, as places where thoughts, as we experience them in our own selves, kind of gather themselves and we can kind of get a view of ourselves from the example of the motion of her consciousness basically is what I'm saying. There's one more poem that I should do for you, and then it will be time to let the talk continue in silence. Yes. Ah. She's speaking here of two senses of time, chronos and kairos, you could say, of the day of the manifestation of time as a part of the succession of our lives. When she writes, Two lengths have every day its absolute extent and area superior. Two lengths have every day its absolute extent and area superior by hope or horror lent. Eternity will be velocity or pause at fundamental signals from fundamental laws. To die is not to go on doom's consummate chart. No territory new is staked. Remain thou as thou art. In other words, the life that we live is unknown and always is. And um, what is real is the patterns that we perceive in our imagination that is given to us as what we are made in the image of, the ability to reflect it in cognitive terms and make that available to other cognitive beings for the edification, edification of the whole. This is a glimpse into the work of Emily Dickinson as a practitioner, as a liberal mystic, and as an inspired poet for us to study as we go on in the unfoldment of our own lives. All right then, I thank you for your heroic listening. I know it is that, and I hope that it is worth the time that you attend to this. 
So, Emily Dickinson wishes you the best because that is what she offers. All right.